Hello, everyone, and happy Friday. Welcome back to Summer Kids Club, um, the parents' tea time at 10. Um, if you guys don't have your tea, you have your coffee, that's cool, too. I know Larissa has her cup of coffee. Um, so we looked at the poll, and thank you um, for voting. Everyone who voted, thank you so much. It's awesome to see what you guys want to hear, what you guys want to discuss. And so Larissa and I are facilitating and we're going to make that happen for you guys. And it looks like we're going to be going over each of those topics, but the winner and the first one to get next week started is uh, kindergarten readiness. And so Monday's topic for Tea Time at 10 will be kindergarten readiness. For all those parents who voted um, for that topic, it will be discussed on Monday. And we are going to have perhaps maybe one or two special guest speakers next week. So stay tuned for that, you guys, because it's going to be so awesome. It's so great that we finally have some other staff that's going to have some time in their schedules because everyone's, everyone's been super busy with everything. Um, but it's great because you guys will get to see and meet some of our other staff members who um, are behind the scenes and helping make SKC happen, as well as they're just huge members in our program and they're important to know. So with that being said, we are going to be talking about redirecting children today to avoid challenging behaviors. Now, this is a really, really um, deep dive topic. And with Tea Time at 10, we don't take a full hour to go over topics, but we just highlighted some of the important things um, about children with ch challenging behaviors such as the what and maybe the whys and how we can redirect them. And I will talk about some of the methods that they use in the classroom and some of the methods that I also um, try to help parents with in the home. And Larissa will help expand on that for me today. Um, okay, guys, so let's jump in. So what, what are challenging behaviors? So for everybody, it's going to look different. Every child is different. Um, every family has their own, you know, struggles with challenging behaviors and to what levels and what degree vary. Um, so, so in some cases, they can be tantrums as extreme as hitting, biting, scratching, maybe pulling hair. Um, Maybe it's something simple, like your child doesn't want to follow directions when given them. Perhaps they're refusing to pick up toys and they, they take all their toys out of their toy box and leave them scattered, but they refuse to pick them up. And that can be challenging because as parents, we want to encourage and teach our children to be responsible and picking up our toys is responsible, but it, they have minds of their own and it can be challenging at times when they refuse you, right? Um, sometimes they may refuse to go to bed, or in a lot of cases, they fight with their siblings, which is very common, but it, you know, it can be challenging for us, and sometimes it's frustrating, right? Um, so those are a few examples of what, but again, every child is different. Every family has their own challenges, so some of them may look less extreme. Some of them may look more extreme. Um, and so we'll talk about where, you know, you can also at the end of this, get some extra resources, um, in case they are a little bit more challenging and you're, you need a little bit of outside, um, help. We can tell you what to look for, um, in terms of support. So why are the, why are challenging behaviors occurring? Well, a lot of parents ask me this, why is this happening? I don't understand they weren't throwing fits before or throwing tantrums before, or they were so helpful for before they wanted to help me sweep the kitchen, but now they don't want to pick up their toys. It, it varies. And as your child gets older and, you know, their personalities um, begin to shine through and they're able to use their language and communicate what they want, what they don't want, you'll notice changes in behaviors, right? So maybe your child's tired. Maybe, you know, with the COVID happening is one example, but perhaps the bedtime routine's a little bit off and they're struggling to develop a pattern because perhaps the pattern is a little bit different. 
maybe bedtime isn't a regular set time. So perhaps your child's not getting enough sleep. That can, that can lead to challenging behaviors. Um, because when we're tired, we get grumpy, right? And we, we don't want to do things that we're told we would rather, you know, take a nap instead. Sometimes we're hu hungry and then other words, hangry. So sometimes children need a snack or a lunch and every child's different and every metabolism is different. So realizing what foods are going to fuel your child and um, how much of those foods to give them is important. Or maybe your child's not feeling well. Maybe they're not displaying outward, um, you know, adverse ex experiences such as, you know, a fever um, or throwing up, but maybe they're just not feeling well. Maybe because they're tired and maybe they have a little bit of a headache or maybe it was really hot the other day and there was a little bit of heat exhaustion. So maybe they're just not quite themselves. These are all possibilities. And these are things as teachers that we look for as well, because we never want to look at the child and say, well, something's wrong. They're, they just don't behave well. As teachers, we don't say that. We go, something's going on and we're going to help this child because this, there's something deeper in the surface here. Um, so another reason maybe is they have trouble communicating. Does your child um, have trouble communicating with language? Um, sometimes um, that's a big one, especially for, for when they're maybe not getting along with their peers perhaps they're have, having trouble communicating to the, their peers what they want and what they need. And uh, as teachers, we're always trying to help provide that language. And so by communicating with our kids regularly, and, and we'll talk about this more because it's, there's a name for it, it's positive descriptive acknowledgements, is describing what is taking place, describing it in action to a child, and that helps promote that language and gives them that language that they'll need to practice to better communicate. Um, and then, you know, a bunch of things tie into that as well. And we've talked about this before about teaching emotions and having um, places set up in the classroom to help children identify the emotions that they're feeling. Larissa, do you want me, do you want to add anything there? Oh, I was just, I was just, taking a little note because I was thinking as you were talking yeah. um, that challenging behavior is a form of communication mm -hmm. and we as as teachers and as educators we try to remember that the child is not the behavior the behavior is actually the child's way of trying to tell us that something is wrong and that is um, our first cue to begin to investigate and you touched on that very nicely and so that's that's our first step is to investigate the why 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 is this behavior happening and and like you said you listed some really good possibilities tired hungry not feeling well um, or or maybe it's it's some emotions that are happening from some other um, trigger. So yeah. And then yeah, no, well said. I'm glad you mentioned that is the, the child should not be defined by their behaviors, but there's a reasoning behind it. That's them expressing themselves, right? I'm so glad you put it that way because it shifts our, it changes our lens and it makes us look at the um, situation much differently. Um, and it helps us kind of ground ourselves and open up our eyes to what is happening around the child for this behavior to happen. And I'm really glad you mentioned that, Larissa. Once upon a time, it was common um, for people to say, oh, you're being a bad boy or you're being a bad girl. And that label tells children that I am my behavior and and we've learned you know as as we grow and and um and 
advance in this knowledge of early childhood, um, we have learned that we have we need to separate the behavior and and view it as as kind of the child's flag waving you know hey there's something wrong check it out help me and um and so and and that doesn't mean that the child is bad um that just means that um they don't exactly have a complete a mastery yet of the communication skills or the understanding of their own emotions or their own physical needs to put it all together and say, gosh, I didn't sleep well last night and I have a headache and so I'm a little grumpy. And so if you guys could just bear with me, that, you know, we never hear children say that. We hear adults say that because adults have more experience in that, in that category. So um, instead kids, kids whine or they you know refuse to follow a direction or something and that's their way of saying something's going on and mm -hmm. you are my person and I'm counting on you to investigate what my problem is and help me understand it and and then help me um, solve the problem so absolutely I love that you you mentioned such a key point right there is you're my person and I'm looking for you to help me figure, figure out what's going on with me. That right there is, is teaching. That right there is teaching and you're your child's teacher. And so yes, when, when they come to school, we teach your children, but you teach your children as well. And that part right there is so important to remember is they don't have the words or all the knowing that we have um, to express ourselves fully. Like Larissa had said, yes, as adults, it's easy for us because we're at this higher level of communication and we can express when we need space or what's going on internally that's maybe having an impact on our other behaviors, but children don't have that. And it's up to us to teach them those skills. I love that you mentioned that. That's, that was beautifully said. Thank you. Um, and you know, it, it's a really good segue into the next section of this in terms of, <clears throat> you know, once we're able to look at that perspective and understand because as teachers we we do observations you know um, but as parents you can do that as well and it, we it helps us to know the why so why is the behavior occurring the when at what time of day um, you know is there is there something in that at that time of day that this is reoccurring and sometimes with children you'll notice a pattern that it's always around the same time either it's around meal time because they're getting hungry or maybe it's a near nap time because they're getting tired um so the when is very important the what so what the behavior is identifying that and the where the where the behavior is taking place so maybe it's in the home Maybe it's at the grocery store. For us teachers, it's like what part of the classroom is the hot spot. Uh, so it maybe it always happens in the dramatic play area. Um, maybe it happens all the time on the playground. But for parents, it'll be different, right? It'll maybe be in the bedroom or it'll be in the living room. So understanding the where of the behavior and then we can help with the redirection and we can help with the teaching, right? Because as soon as we have kind of the understanding that we need to help our children, then we're gonna be that much more successful when they do come to us asking for us for guidance. Um, and so how we can help promote behaviors we wish to see um, and redirect children is um, praising, the, the behaviors, the desired behaviors. I like to say desired behaviors. There's also, they're also called positive behaviors. Um, but I like desired behaviors because I really don't like the words positive or negative for me. I think they're, they can kind of go with stigma of like good and bad. Um, but for me, positive, um, positive desired behaviors um, is like a different way of putting it. So that's just like what I have to say about it. 
So desired behaviors are things that we'd like to see. So we'd like to see them picking up toys. We'd like to see them using their words with their siblings, asking for turn taking because maybe they're fighting over who gets to play the Xbox next. I don't know. Uh, whatever you guys have in the home. And then, um, so I wrote down an example here. So say your child is struggling with hitting. Um, yes, it's easy to say, no, stop, don't hit. But what we're really enforcing is what hitting looks like, and we're not giving them an alternative of what hitting, um, what the opposite of hitting looks like. So gentle touches, and this is where we start teaching gentle touches. And um, for example, I have Max over here, and with kids, I'll usually bring like Max or a stuffy of their choice into the home with them. And for teachers, we have a puppet. Parents, you can use a pet. You can use a puppet of their own. But you can teach gentle touches by showing them what gentle touches look like. See, I'm being gentle because I'm using my hand to gently stroke the, the puppet or the pet. Because maybe you guys have a dog or a cat. And you're demonstrating what it looks like because... All children are different and some some need that visual um, and especially if maybe they've seen it but they didn't know what it was called you know because maybe they we assume that they know what that is but maybe in reality they don't and so when they are being gentle and we're showing them that and they try it we can be descriptive by with our praise by saying you are being so kind. You are using gentle touches while petting, petting our dog, Benji. You know, you're being descriptive right there. And you're telling them what they are doing. And so you're putting um, an explanation behind gentle touches. So you're, you're now showing them what it looks like, but you're also saying being gentle means gently petting right um and that's that's one example Larissa do you want to provide a different one because I don't know um <laughs> something was just in my head and now it's kind of slipped uh I was thinking of oh catching them being good is is basically yeah. what what you're um, talking about right now. And again, to go back in time, um, I think that the parenting style from a generation or two back was to just acknowledge children when they were in the midst of an undesired behavior, you know, only when they were doing something that the parents didn't want them to do, and then they would catch them yes. doing something and they would be disciplined or, you know, um, and so again, as we learn more and as we grow, um, we have also learned that um, behaviors can be turned around a lot faster and a lot gentler with a lot higher success rate if we catch kids doing what we want them to, like you were saying, and I agree with you. Um, not the positive behavior, but the desired behavior. You know, exactly. if, if they are sitting in the living room playing with their blocks and um, maybe they're playing with a sibling and they're sharing back and forth, it is so easy to want to just let them be because they're doing what you want them to and you don't want to, you know, disturb it. You don't want to kind of, you know, stir the pot. However, just by walking up and very softly, very quietly, just say, you know, I see that you two are having a lot of fun right now. You're playing together very nicely and then just walk away. You know, so you don't have to, you don't have to get, you know, in the middle of it and, and completely stop their play. Just kind of do a drive-by acknowledgement of you guys are doing some great stuff and I see how happy you are. You know, um, I see your smiles on your face. Like you're saying, be as descriptive as you can, but then get out, you know, go on. And, uh, but yeah, catching them in, 
in um, those moments that uh, that they're doing things that you would like. That goes a long way to help children know, hey, I'm doing it, and, and then they'll want to do more of that. So that also helps prevent, that's in the prevention category of challenging behaviors. Absolutely, well said. And it's better to be descriptive because we can tell children that they're doing a good job, but again, what does a good job mean? A good job as adults, we know, oh, we're doing well, but children, we're, we have to teach them what a good job looks like and um, what it means to do a good job. So the A plus on the homework, good job, well, it could go to, you worked really hard on writing your letters and you, you got a good grade as a result because you worked so hard and you practiced. And so we're being descriptive with how they did a good job. And that will help inspire them to know, okay, I, I did this and this is what I did. So I'm going to do it more because I earned my, my family members attention. And essentially children, that's all they really want from us is our attention. So like Larissa said, even when we're doing the drive-by, we're providing it. And maybe it's not when they want it from us, but we're providing it because we're being descriptive and we're, we're using that as a teachable moment there. Um, and it's in those moments that we want to catch them, right? Because those are the desired behaviors. So that was really good. I'm glad you gave that example. And so um, we can also, you know, try planned ignoring so <clears throat> say um say they're yelling i i use this one a lot because this is what children do often is they yell and they yell to get our attention um and i have parents go but i can't ignore them and i said well when it's safe to ignore the behavior only when it's safe if they're tantruming and they like to throw their heads down and and it's not a safe space for them to do that because there's a bar there or there's a wall there then by all means you you must intervene but planned ignoring would look like okay your child's coming up to meet you and going mom 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 and you're in the middle of a conversation mom 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 and eventually you're gonna go what well it worked they they annoyed you to the point of I got your attention, I got louder, I got more repetitive, and it worked. And so now we're the, the behavior that's being enforced is the undesired one, and that's the maybe the interrupting or the yelling or the persistence of interruption, right? And so planned ignoring, yeah, while it's hard, um, it works because, yes, your child will get louder that's going to be guaranteed because they are going to push their boundaries and they're going to push yours because they are learning and they want to know what is going to work for them and so if they get louder and you give in right if we give in we're like yes we're encouraging okay loud louder works and that's really a ticklish spot to be in because we're like okay, we were just, we couldn't handle it anymore. And it was really, it was really getting on my nerves. I had to look. But if we can just hold on a little bit, and as soon as they stop, as soon as that moment happens, that's when we look and go, I see that you're calm now. What is it that you needed? And so we're being descriptive, like, okay, they were calm and they were quiet. Like, I see that you're calm now. I see that you wanted my attention. What did you need? Um, so we're being, being descriptive by what they're doing and we're using planned ignoring because we're telling them the yelling is the undesired behavior. They're not, that's not how they're going to get what they want from us. How they're going to get it is by being respectful and by being polite, right? And, um, Larissa, correct me if I'm wrong, but does, does that seem to have worked for you as an educator in the past? Planned ignoring is, um, a very important, um, strategy that um, can be used. What I would say is that, especially at home, well, and, and in our classrooms also, is that we have observed first and noticed specific behaviors that we want to put in the category of planned ignoring. 
And then next, what we will do is preview that with the child, because if we just do it in the moment and just yes. don't give them any of our attention, that's a huge struggle. And the children can be very confused by it. However, you used a perfect example, the interrupting mom, 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 mom. And I don't know, there's, uh, there was a, um, I think it was the Simpsons or something that, that did that, that. Bart Simpson would say that, mama, 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 mommy, mommy, mama. And then she goes, what? <laughs> and all he says at the end was, hi. <laughs> oh, yeah, family it was, guy. <laughs> yeah, oh, is it family guy? Okay. So um, that's a perfect example because really, you know, they didn't really want anything but to say hi, but that's how they did it. Um, no. So instead, being on the telephone is huge when you're a parent and your child is standing there. So talk to them first. Um, it also can go back into, um, to backtrack a little bit, creating a set of family rules. And they should be very simple. And um, the ones that we use in the classroom, there's only three. And you can fit almost anything into these three categories. And it is be safe, be kind, and listen. And so when there is a behavior that pops up, we can refer it to any one of those three, but that doesn't leave a whole giant list of, of rules for children to try to remember. It's just very simple. And so you have your, your family rules, your simple family rules, then you, you preview it with the child and you say, okay, when I'm on the phone and you need my attention, sometimes that's a problem. So let's talk about what will happen. And then you can practice and you can say, you know, when you say my name too many times, I'm going to wait until you're using the signal, you know, whatever, quietly. Maybe you yeah. put your finger on your lips and you put your hand in the air or something. Um, and and then I can give you my attention when you do it that way. And however, when you say my name a lot of times, I'm not going to answer you. And so then when that behavior happens, because it usually will happen again in real you know, life, then the parent or, or the teacher can refer back and say, remember, I, we talked about this and I said I wasn't giving you my attention until and then insert the desired behavior. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, um, that is, is always a good thing to always make sure that you have some simple rules in place, that you talk about it in advance so that it's not sprung on the child and, and really confusing. Because if Absolutely. it's worked for them in the past, all of a sudden, you're right. If it stops working, they're going to up the ante. They're going to say, ooh, I need to yell louder. I need to throw a fit. I need to kick my feet. I need to throw things yep. because I'm, this isn't working. I need to try harder. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. Absolutely. And by previewing those behaviors, like Larissa said, we're, we're still teaching. We're still, that's another opportunity to talk to our children about what we want to see, what the desired behaviors are going to look like, and what's going to happen. Um, because, again, to kind of touch back on routines, um, children often will um, have display challenging behaviors because they have anxiety and they don't know what's going to happen next. And so by telling them and be de being descriptive, okay, well, now they know, and they, they kind of have an idea of what the expectation is going to be, but once it's, once you follow through with it, and you say, okay, you've previewed it, you talked about it, you've waited for them to calm down, and said, okay, remember when we talked about that? I waited for you, you know, to, to calm, and now you have my attention. And so you're just constantly reinforcing that and that's reinforcing the desired behavior. And yes, it will be challenging because if it's like Larissa said, if it's worked in the past, they will test your limits. But, you know, it's important that we stay true and um, 
strong with you know our dispositions because it can be it can be hard it can be challenging for us especially as parents when you guys have so much on your plate and um you know, we've also talked about visual visual aids. So previewing can also be a visual aid as well. Some of some of my parents have had to do visual aids, and we have those in the classrooms as well to show. Okay, this is what's happening next. And then at twelve thirty, you know, we'll gather around for you know meal time or whatever the case may be. But if you have the visual aids to go along with your, you know, maybe your rules, that can be a double whammy, right? That can really help the kiddos because you can always walk them over to the, that visual aid and be like, look, you remember, you see, this is what's going to happen next. Um, and that can also alleviate the anxiety and that can maybe they do need that little reminder and that will help them and they can, they can be like, okay, yeah, okay, I, I understand. Um, so, you know, there's a bunch of different options to try, um, you know, replacing things that they can't do with things that they can, um, and that kind of ties back into, you know, this is our visual aid, you can kind of reinforce that. Um, you can, you can also, um, you can also, and I wanted to mention this a little bit later, but if you guys need an extra help, you guys can also search out positive parenting classes, and that's what they're called, um, and they're triple P classes. And, you know, some of you guys may be familiar, um, our FSSs um, are always handing out triple P tip sheets to parents who are in a little bit of more need because maybe they're really struggling with a behavior and those triple P tip sheets are really handy. Well, we all undergo triple P certification. So I myself am trained, um, Larissa is trained, all, most, all of our staff, all the FSSs. And it's not just for parents who you know, who are struggling. It's for parents who maybe they do, they do do these things um, and it's working, but maybe you want a little bit more knowledge. It's a wonderful, wonderful couple week program. You go through um, and you learn so much and it helps you to look at children a little differently and look at yourself a little differently. And it's so beneficial. It's so helpful. And I mean, I'm, I think that the, what was once first five is now, um, it was being offered through first five at the ARC, but it's now called the Pearl, right? Um, it's the Pearl over on by Grace Hudson. Okay. Um, where the Boys and Girls Club is. And so you can always check out their website to see what's going on. Um, you can always look at First Five, too. They're a really great resource, and they help put on the Triple P programs. And I would suggest them to anybody who maybe needs a little bit of, um, a more of a deep dive into this topic, who maybe needs some extra tools or ideas on how to work with kids, because there there are so many. And they will they're it's a hands-on class so they have you role play and so you can practice with a partner um they help guide you to to help you pause and go okay wait you see that there this is what can be tweaked and that's really helpful because that helps us refine our techniques and helps us um all the more when it when it comes to the real thing with working with our kids um so yeah so I think that was about it um, in terms of what I, I had written down here. I wanted to kind of keep it brief because this can be a really lengthy topic, but we've talked about, years. <laughs> huh? it can, it can take years and years. It can take years oh, and years uh -huh. and it's always changing. There's it always is. new research coming yeah. out on, on this topic. And so we've talked about the, what, the why of it, the, when, the, where, the observe the observing of the behaviors, um, how to promote the, the desired behaviors that we want to see. And that's by using 
PDA, so positive descriptive acknowledgements, um, previewing and planned ignoring, um, and we've also talked about <clears throat> um, using visual aids. We've also talked about today um, our little triple P plug because triple P is wonderful and we love triple P. Um, but as for me, that's all I had to say. Larissa, you want to add anything to this before we sign off? Um, no, I think you've done a great job in covering it all. Um, I, I think that the only thing that I always um, like to recommend for parents and, and family members is to just spend some time observing your child with you know kind of a neutral lens just to just to recognize in the moment where they are and, and what's happening um, uh, watch them play and and also during the challenging behaviors the why yeah so thank you Thank you. And thank you guys for tuning in today. Happy Friday. We will see you on Monday with our kindergarten readiness topic. So tune in and comment be below. Um, anyways, have a wonderful day, guys. Bye.